Good day everyone, I am Frederic Salimi. This e-course will be uploaded in our training uh, workspace. If you are interested in full access of this e-course, please send us an email given in description. Have a good day and talk to you later. A brief description about my qualification and experience. Uh, I have a master degree in dependability, which covers safety, reliability, maintainability, and availability. I also have a BS degree in process control and instrumentation. I work several years with engineering companies like Technib and operators like Total. I was involved in pre-project, uh, feed, detail design, construction, and operation. Today we discuss about reliability, availability, and maintainability. This is a generic version and will be customized for your project or for your installations later. This course takes one day. We give you access to EPC 365 a training monitor for discussions. The objective of this course is to give a practical understanding of reliability, availability, and maintainability for oil and gas installations. Now let's uh, talk about uh, uh, bus stop curve. In fact, uh, for failure rate is at the beginning of any uh, equipment is an early life period and we, we have year out period. And when you are uh, doing the availability uh, uh, study, uh, we only take about useful life uh, period, for example, 25 years during this area, we will uh, do the study. So RAM study should uh, consider all operational activities, preventive maintenance and inspection, and yearly production profile, gas and oil. And it should not consider this part of the uh, mass stop care and, and this uh, we are out. It will not consider uh, CMOP and it will not consider catastrophic events. So the methodology is first the determination of the functional diagram. We use PFTs and UFTs and uh, assumptions. And then we have to do cause and effect analysis, uh, FMEA. And this is based on PNIDs and uh, utility uh, instrumentation diagram. We use the uh, selection of the reliability data from OREDA and other sources or CCPS. Uh, selection of the operational uh, data, this is from project, and, uh, uh, and for calculation is maintenance uh, characteristics, operating philosophy, uh, and then goes to production availability calculation and then conclusion and recommendation. So if you see here is functional breakdown, uh, normally we do it in three steps. First is identification of uh, uh, item considering the system. For example, here the system that we we'll, uh, we'll look at the system and then a determination of functional relationship between these items. For example, this uh, system, if it fails, uh, the whole system fails, or here the redundancy, if, if one fails, there is another one, and then uh, we have to uh, determine the functional uh, relationships. And determination of how main function is handled through these uh, uh, functional relationships and uh, uh, this is the way and uh, item considered as functional description normally is rotating machines, electric uh, machines, uh, vessels, exchanger, utility package and uh, sensor and valves because in this uh, equipment or system, system and valves are considered in detail during the uh, FMEA uh, analysis. So the symbol that we use for uh, functional units, uh, uh, subsystem and equipment uh, are uh, shown inside the box. 
and these are the uh, the type of the uh, box that we show for example this one is if equipment a failure has an impact on production level the box is drawn with a continuous line like this if equipment B can be considered as 100% available the box is drawn with according to the line uh, and the sentence 100% uh, available like this if equipment uh, C failure has no impact on production level and the box in the uh, drawn in dotted level I will show you later the functional diagram that uh, a typical example of this and if equipment D is not normally used uh, the production line is shot and uh, offline here is uh, item A has no redundancy like this it shows uh, the uh, in sense with other part of the planned items here uh, here A has no redundancy B has no redundancy like this when there is a redundancy like this if item A1 and A2 are redundant items A2 can uh, A2 can fully uh, compensate for a A1 failure they are shown in parallel like this one is running one in the uh, standby and uh, bypassing of items for example without any production loss and burn without uh, time limitation is like this and uh, without any production loss but with a time limitation for example if it's 12 over uh, like this and uh, also we show it here with the same production loss and without uh, time limitation for example 70 percent about 14,000 barrel of uh, per day and here we don't with some uh, production loss and with limitation for example 12 over 70 percent of uh, 14,000 uh, barrel of, uh, per day and here is a uh, uh, turn up capacity capacity for example redundant items may have uh, turn up calculation in order to compensate for the failure of associated uh, redundant uh, for some 70 percent will go through this if for example uh, one of these phase and the other two uh, will uh, will work uh, two running one doesn't work and the uh, explanation is here failure mode and effect analysis fmea the cause and effect analysis aim to identify the events which may cause uh, production losses and their consequences on production availability so prior to fmea workshop consultant shall analyze the uh, provided pnids and identify system and equipment to be addressed during FMEA workshop. The result of the functional analysis step should be reported in the FMEA worksheets and the following rules shall be applied during the FMEA workshop. The cause and effect analysis will be performed on the items identified during functional analysis step on plant uh, e event which may e induce a production loss uh, will be identified if several fluids are considered the consequence of each uh, each of them will be analyzed if deemed relevant for the study objective and the cause and effect analysis will be more focused on effect than on causes and the analysis will be done in a systematic manner based on a, a systematic method FMEA workshop will focus on random uh, failure of equipment items plant uh, events uh, will be documented in assumption register uh, for each equipment item the following information will be determined the tag number equipment description 
equipment type if it is a pump filter separator criticality if this is important yes or no depending on the equipment if critical or not for the production equipment configuration redundancy equipment on the function and uh, also production loss for example, the consequence if failure has on, on the operation functions or a status of the highest uh, uh, endangered level in terms of loss of production in percentage of the overall normal design production. And the compensation provision, uh, we have maintenance and operation mitigation measures or recovery actions that are available or can be taken by an operator to negate or mitigate the effect of the failure on the system. For example, flaring, bypass, spare, and these are all the things that should be discussed in uh, FMEA workshop. So this is a typical example of the uh, FMEA worksheet. Here you have the equipment tag number, equipment description, uh, equipment type, and it, the criticality, yes or no, about equipment configuration, if it is uh, redundancy or it is alone. And here is about uh, a note about the uh, uh, impact on failure and repair. So in cause and effect analysis, uh, failure of interest should be on control loop, uh, no control, ESD and shutdown valve, spurious operation, uh, opening or closure depending on safety function, BDV, spurious operation, opening because it is fail open, PSV, spurious operation, external leakage, and safety sensor, spurious signal. And all the sensor with two out of three voting uh, should be considered as 100% available. So this is a typical of a cause and effect analysis. Here is a, a slug catcher. And we have to give the references to the PNID and other uh, documentation. And if there is different sheets, we have to write it. This is the uh, slug catcher. It is a uh, failure mode is critical, loss of separation system. And then uh, control loop uh, and uh, safety sensor, uh, ESTB, shutdown valve, blowdown valve, and PSV, because it is one of two. Uh, the, we don't discuss about this because uh, the, if the one doesn't work, the other works. So definition about meaning of the reliability data is uh, failure rate. The failure is, rate is assumed to be constant value and independent of the time. About repair time, repair time is the, the corrective maintenance repair time uh, are distributed according to an exponential uh, distribution uh, and the repair rate is constant and it is this formula and basically with mean time uh, to repair uh, we have to identify, we have to write it in reliability data. And critical and degraded failure. And this we can get it from the OREDA. Critical failure is a failure which causes immediate or complete loss of the system cap capability of providing its output. Degraded uh, failure is a failure which is not critical but which uh, prevents uh, the system from providing its output within a specification. So if you see here, this should be uh, uh, a table like this should be uh, in the report. And basically what we have to write here, item description, for example, uh, centrifugal compressor, and description of data is critical, degraded mode, and full uh, uh, and fail to start. And this is uh, gamma, is failure rate, and uh, it has MTTF, mean time between failure one and a half years. 
we have to give the references to this and uh, for auditability and traceability it is exponential and uh, and uh, the repair parameters is number of hours and then given the references with the uh, comments about the company uh, uh, experience etc this is for electrical equipment the same approach we have for mechanical equipment and valves and sensors uh, you have to this is a uh, is a rectangular rail it's basically if there is something that you can replace it and it will be it's not exponential it is rectangular it is re re uh, by replacement uh, so here MTTR takes uh, no account for SOV uh, replacement time but uh, not the mobilization time and it's normally this is the certain assumption you have to agree and also certain other things for example uh, uh, blue air package air instrumentation dryer etc assumption data sheets uh, should be added to the report and basically here about the production profile must be uh, documented definition and basis of study and the operation information for example inspection uh, preventive maintenance task etc the vendor representative all should be documented and traceable and also the other things about the assumption uh, data sheets startup time uh, uh, flaring policy gas flow rates and for the reliability and the statistical data about uh, failure uh, of uh, load shedding uh, control units uh, and external hydrocarbon leaks these reliability and statistical data should be reported for traceability and auditability. I give you an example. For example, this was for the uh, uh, this control system, and uh, basically you have to write it here, and also it should be written here. Uh, is checked by. Uh, approved by and by the company approval so all the assumption data should be uh, uh, traceable and auditable so this is a typical example of overall functional uh, breakdown for example here there is a separation and after that it goes to mercury removal unit and then mpgas separation so each of these uh, system if they don't work uh, we lost availability of the plant so they are in series and uh, and also for example here there are certain redundancy here uh, for example this is a standby if it doesn't work this will work and also here they put it at gas metering uh, station that uh, it doesn't affect the productivity of the plant but i don't think that it is the case because if the local authority they don't have this gas metering station working i think it's the uh, shutdown of production but this was discussed by the company and they took into consideration that it will not uh, stop the production and that's affect on the availability of the plant the same things here for example uh, these are the uh, open drain system if open drain system doesn't work you can um, produce and uh, but if your power uh, distribution doesn't work you cannot build this etc this is a detailed uh, functional diagram for example for each of those diagram for example if you saw on the on the top there were uh, a acid gas removal unit uh, uh, this is uh, inside the acid gas removal unit there is also a uh, 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 detailed functional diagram and it should be given in the in the report so availability based on the uh, 
functional block diagram uh, we can uh, calculate the availability as per uh, ISO 2818 the gas production availability is defined as the actual volume of gas production in one year divided by the amount of gas facility could have produced if uh, had a 100% availability so this is this formula and uh, based on this uh, the uh, the uh, consultant calculate the ability if there is gas if there is uh, condensate and also uh, flare gas quantity on a yearly basis so if you see here this is a typical uh, executive summary that if you see here for example here the vessel inspection is 34 percent of contribution to the availability here and also uh, the second main contribution to gas production uh, shortfall is gas dew point units uh, so based on that uh, you can you can see the contribution to unavailability of the plant and get a, a recommendation and conclusion for that now I show you how to go to EPC training uh, workspace. You click on uh, RAM and when you are in RAM, you click on the reliability data. When you enter, you can insert all uh, company studies uh, about the RAM and then uh, we will create a e-course. When it is approved, we will uh, uh, insert a new discussion uh, and then uh, employee can ask the question uh, and then our experts will answer to their questions. I added to this D course a uh, reliability center maintenance RCM was presented by ABB. I, I found it this uh, very good uh, presentation and it, it uh, explained about equipment criticality analysis, failure mode and effect analysis and implementation. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, uh, please send us an email at pmc at ebc365.com. We have two websites. One is in French, one is in English. There are uh, requests from there and you can send us an email. We get back to you as soon as possible. Have a good day and talk to you in our next workshop. Hello, my name is Dave Biros. I'm the Global Product Marketing Manager for ABB Process Automation Service. And today we're going to learn about an important service concept called reliability-centered maintenance. Now, why would we want to learn about reliability-centered maintenance? It's considered the world-class maintenance approach for process industries and manufacturing and other industries as well. So we're going to cover three main areas in this presentation. It's just an overview, uh, but those three main areas are equipment criticality and analysis, failure modes and effects analysis on the equipment, and some basics about how to implement reliability-centered maintenance. So let's start with the definition of reliability-centered maintenance. Reliability-centered maintenance is a high-level maintenance strategy that's meant to optimize all the assets in the facility, and it uses a variety of maintenance approaches uh, to put together an overall approach that's meaningful for every different system or equipment category. And these maintenance strategies are optimized to really provide the most overall efficient functioning of the plant. So the notion of preventive maintenance is that the more preventive maintenance we do, as you can see here in this line that's curving up, these bars that curve up here, then the fewer unplanned maintenance activities will be required. Those are break and fix, emergency repairs. What also happens, the more preventive maintenance that we do, the actual planned maintenance hours also come down. We're just doing things more effectively and we see cost benefits across the board. But what if we do too much preventive maintenance? Is that possible? It is possible. There's a sweet spot where we only want to do the right kind of maintenance at the right time. If we touch the equipment too much, we can actually induce failures that are costly, or we can just spend too much time maintaining equipment. 
and the actual cost will begin to creep up. So we want to be right here in this sweet spot. So what did we have before reliability-centered maintenance? Well, first of all, we had reactive maintenance. Something breaks and we go and fix it. The idea is to get that equipment back up as quickly as possible. There's no real preventive maintenance with that approach. Uh, costs aren't really considered that carefully. Uh, it's popular because it's very easy to deploy. Something breaks and we go fix it. It's very ineffective. It's a very inefficient use of manpower and capital. Well, we've already discussed preventive maintenance. Of course, that's the next step. If we can address something that might break on a piece of equipment before it breaks, then we're a step ahead of the game. But as I also said, it's possible to do too much preventive maintenance. We don't want to do too much, but still that's a step in the right direction. And it's usually time directed. We do it on a regular basis. Every six weeks, we're going to lubricate a piece of machinery. Then we go to proactive maintenance. This is the notion of looking at a, a production line or a piece of equipment even before it's put into operation and make sure that it's easy to access to maintain. Or to look at equipment and say, is that equipment, is that piece of equipment easy to maintain? Should we replace that equipment? Or if you're building a plant or building a new line, you can have that as a criteria of looking at new equipment. Is this equipment easy to maintain? That's proactive maintenance. There's also predictive maintenance. This is when we use a variety of technologies, such as infrared or, or thermography or lubrication analysis, different kinds of technology, to assess a piece of equipment even while it's in operation. Uh, that might be able to determine certain things on that piece of equipment that we can't see with our naked eye or we can't hear uh, that will alert us, hey, something needs to be addressed here. Then finally, we get to reliability-centered maintenance. And as I mentioned before, reliability-centered maintenance takes advantages, advantage of all of those things and only chooses the right approach for the right piece of equipment, even reactive maintenance. Or a strategy might be to not choose any maintenance approach at all. A right strategy might be to just let a piece of equipment run to failure. If it's low cost and you have a hot spare, maybe it's just too costly to try to touch that on a regular basis. Let it, let it fail. All right, so let's talk about the three main steps to effective reliability-centered maintenance. The first one is to make sure that you preserve equipment functionality by establishing criticality levels of the equipment. The second was to, is to identify and prioritize failure modes. Once we understand what the equipment criticality is, then we can start looking at what's likely to fail on this piece of equipment and put together some plans to address it. And then thirdly, implement reliability-centered maintenance by choosing the correct approaches. So for criticality, let me just state this clearly. The first consideration for criticality should always be safety. Here we have an example of a refinery in Asia, I won't name the country, that exploded in 1992 and the explosion killed a number of people and injured many more. When the analysis was done on why the explosion occurred, it was determined that it was really a maintenance failure. You see there some of the reasons for why. Repeated ratcheting, redu reducing diameter of a gasket retainer, well, I'm not that familiar with this case, but repeated ratcheting, that could be an example of too much preventive maintenance. So the right maintenance approaches weren't taken here and it led to a disaster. So as I said, safety is always number one when you're putting together criticality analysis. Environmental is up there in the same level of safety. The next consideration is production stoppage. If you're not making product, you're not making money. The third one is the maintenance expense. How costly is it to repair a certain piece of equipment? The fourth is the effect on the systems. Remember, systems is a collection of equipment. So what is the effect if something breaks here? What kind of effect will a ripple effect will it have on other pieces of equipment? Could be a big effect, so take that into consideration. And fifth, redundancy. Does this production or is this process have some redundant features so that if it fails in one area, it picks up in another area? If it's lacking redundancy, then it could be a, a, a higher level of criticality. We put those criticalities into certain levels. So this is an example of criticality level number one. First of all, if a failure occurred here, then it could result in a loss of life, or it would, high likelihood of resulting in loss of life, or limb, or permanent disability. 
high likelihood of an environmental emission, high likelihood of a very costly impact on production, and high likelihood of a costly equipment repair. Maybe there's no redundancy with that system, so that would get a criticality level number one. Then we just go down there, criticality level number two might be a measurable impact on safety and environmental or, or uh, a less costly impact to production or a less costly maintenance, you get the idea. Level three, just a potential, still something to watch out for but not high likelihood. Um, and then number four, no safety effects, no environmental effects, no impact on production, very minimal, minimal maintenance costs and maybe there's multiple redundancy in, in this level, and so you just don't have to worry that much about it. So those are criticality levels. And before we can assign criticality, we need to establish the systems. Systems is a group of components uh, in an equipment category, a piece of equipment and all the subcomponents, or it could just be one singular complex piece of equipment. Here's an example. We'd have a major system with major, sub, major assemblies, major sub-assemblies, components, and we get down to a part level. For, for example, a compressed air system. We'd have compressor assemblies, compressor units. Uh, each compressor unit would have a motor, a compressor, and controls. And then you get down to a parts level with a motor. So we want to identify all the major components of a system, group them together if we can, just do it in a sensible fashion. So, for instance, we would have with that same kind of example, we would have in our failure modes and effects analysis worksheet, we'd have the compressed air system looking at the subsystem of air compressor assembly, and the components would be compressor, motor, and valve. Then we want to identify the failure modes. What could go wrong with each of those components? So that for a compressor, for instance, it might seize, and that would be a failure. For motor, it might fail to start, failure. Valve fails to close, failure. Next, we want to look at the failure mechanisms. What would cause these things to fail? Uh, here's just some examples. It could be corrosion or erosion or a, or a part fails or it's not calibrated, so forth. So again, in our example, uh, with a compressor, uh, the failure mode is that it seizes and what would cause that might be a bearing failure. So we just go through all of our systems like that and fill out this sheet and we create a likelihood table of that happening with a level such as this, remote, very low, low, high, up to extreme. We also want an effects descriptions. So if we think about the levels that we defined earlier when we were talking about levels of criticality, a level one criticality would be loss of life, body part, or lost time accident, and so forth. Uh, so we want to identify those specifically because we want to apply we want to have an apples-to-apples -apples comparison with all the systems in, a, in the plant. So again, back to our example, we have, uh, with a compressor, we have the likelihood of it happening as ranked high, and we also have the failure effect also ranked high. It would have a major impact on production. Then we want to put together the actions that we would take if there were a failure. So we put together a list of recommendations. If a compressor seizes uh, as a result of a bearing failure, we know that that's high likelihood and also uh, a high negative impact on production. So the recommended action is to maintain lubrication. So that was just a very cursory overview of what criticality analysis and failure modes and effect analysis is. Now we'll talk briefly about how a plant would actually implement reliability centered maintenance. First of all, you wanna make sure you have a team, a cross-functional team. You would have that include mechanical maintenance, uh, instrumentation, electrical maintenance, process control, operations, systems or plant engineering, and perhaps a facilitator. You'd want to understand your current maintenance processes. After you've done that criticality analysis and the failure modes and effect analysis, you might have identified areas where your processes just wouldn't allow you to really effectively act on the recommendations that you just put together as part of the failure modes and effect analysis. You want to put together a plan then to address those areas that might be weaknesses in your processes. Uh, start by setting goals. What do we really want to do here? Do we want to increase production? What are the plant's business goals? Are we starting up a new line and so we want to get it right the first time? Do we need to reduce maintenance costs? 
put together your approach, how are you going to track it, uh, how are you going to, who's going to be responsible for what, make sure that people know that they're accountable so there's a name for a certain action so it doesn't fall into the cracks. Finally, implement into an enterprise asset management system, also known as a computerized maintenance management system. This is software that where work orders can be implemented and the preventive maintenance routines can be in there and the planning and scheduling can be done there and all the things that we've just discussed can all be implemented in there and it expedites effective uh, implementation of reliability-centered maintenance.